Okay, good morning. Um, well, let me start by thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me to this very interesting recollection of the old days. And um, I would like to dedicate this talk to my lifelong friend and collaborator, Marcello Ciafaloni, a very fine theorist who passed away just last Friday. Um, now, um, so um, as the title uh, indicates, this will be a rather personal uh, recollection. It will also be quite historical. And while preparing the talk, I realized that I really have worked quite a lot on QCD, more than I could really remember. So there are, there's a long list of topics, and <clears throat> I will be going rather superficially and non-technically about them, but also with the aim of stressing how, whether and how they are relevant even today. So, um, sorry. This doesn't scroll. Well, okay. So uh, let me start with a little preamble. Um, so during my career, I have oscillated many times between string theory and QCD, and uh, the reason why this relationship with QCD is a little complex is that if sometimes I'm referred to as the father of string theory, certainly QCD has killed my five-year-old baby, and this was a little disappointment, I would say. But I have been one of the first to concede this defeat of the dual resonance model to QCD and to switch to QCD. Uh, and at least until string theory came back in 1984 as a theory of quantum gravity and all interactions. And nonetheless, while I have been working mostly since 84 on quantum stri uh, string gravity, uh, transplanchian energy collisions, string cosmology, and so on, I have been repeatedly distracted by interesting problems in strong interactions and in QCD. So this talk will be about some of those switches back and forth and also about those distractions. So the outline is something like this. I will start, say, from around 65, when I graduated, I got my master degree in Florence. Uh, then, uh, so this will be the before QCD part of the talk. Then how I entered QCD through what I call the large end door. And then I will go on with some work I've done in perturbative QCD and in non-perturbative QCD. Now, about the more recent involvement in QCD, I will only mention the titles, but in the slides there are a few remarks about these last three points. So you see it's a long list, but as I said, I think I can go pretty quickly uh, without entering into too many details. So before QCD, um, um, so as a student in Florence of Raul Gatto in the mid-60s in Florence, I was somehow attracted by the strong interaction problem. Uh, and this was in spite of the fact that Gatto himself and his so-called Gattini, Altarelli, Maiani, Preparata, were mostly focused on the weak interactions. And early encounters with Sergio Fubini reinforced that tendency of mine and got me interested in current algebra and its hadronic saturation. I continued on this path as a graduate student at the Weizmann Institute, first with Hector Rubinstein, later on with also with Miguel Virasoro and Marco Ademollo. And we turned from current algebra to so-called superconvergence and finite energy sum rules, imposing the Dolan-Horn-Smith duality, which had just appeared in 67, led to some interesting bootstrap constraints and it seems that some of these things are coming back now. For instance, here is a very recent paper uh, using very much the same 
kind of concepts. Um, now, that phase, as you know, culminated in the construction of the dual resonance model, the analysis of its uh, hagedon like spectrum, the operator formalism, the Virasoro conditions on ghost elimination, the Virasoro algebra, and the suggestions that there was an underlying string theory. And the connection was eventually fully established through formulating precisely the classical, the action of the classical relativistic string, Nambu and Goto, and through its first correct uh, light cone quantization by these four people in 72. And paradoxically, as soon as the dual resonance model, which for many years was something very difficult to sell, because one didn't quite understand where it was coming from, that had been raised to the level of a respectable theory, it also became apparent very soon that it was not the right one for the strong interaction. In a sense, it was too revolutionary a theory, a theory of fundamental strings, uh, to be inside any QFT framework. So QCD, which I would call also a, a revolutionary theory, ma non troppo if you know the Italian music uh, jargon, uh, well, it's revolutionary because you know it was very hard a priori to think about a theory whose fundamental fields were not seen asymptotically. However, with its proven ultraviolet freedom, the conjecture and later proven infrared slavery or confinement, leading indeed to string-like excitations via the chromoelectric flux tubes. And finally, this was the turning point for me, a reinterpretation of the duality diagram itself, themselves and their higher topology in terms of a large NC expansion then thanks to all that, clearly uh, QCD took over. I remind you that in the large NC limit, QCD resonances have zero width. The scattering amplitude is therefore, should be meromorphic, a meromorphic function, should obey most likely dolan horst smith duality if the amplitude is well behaved asymptotically. It generates a scale through uh, famous dimensional transmutation and even fixes the adronic coupling. Also, this was for me, perhaps regretfully, a point of no return, at least to the adronic string. Um, so how did I enter QCD? I would say through the large end door, and I'll try to explain why and how. Um, in, 19, in the summer of 1970, I wrote a paper with Di Giacomo, Fubini, and Sertorio at CERN. And um, that was about how to unitarize dual resonance model. And the idea was that topology, rather than the order in the string coupling, was the organizing criterion. The first two terms of that new expansion uh, were identified with the region trajectory, the QQ bar region trajectory. The next term in the expansion was the cylinder type uh, topology, yeah, um, which you can cut through the middle. And you see there uh, uh, green loops and blue loops, which corresponds to kind of two ordered chains of mesons. Now, um, I later argued that some, under some reasonable assumption, the Pomeroy intercept had to be near and possibly even higher than one, and that irrespectively of the region intercept, which itself was constrained to be below one by nonlinear, in, in a form of nonlinear unitarity, which was called planar unitarity. And the argument. I used, used uh, Feynman's analog gas model. I don't know if you heard about it or remember about it. And Dalton's law, the fact that the pressure of two non-interacting species in a gas is the sum of the two individual pressures. And here is a sketch of the argument. You basically say that the Pomeron cross-section corresponds to the cross-section for two particles going to 
x and y, where x and y is any number of blue and red, uh, blue and green circles on my diagram, whereas the region, as you can see from this diagram, you know, has only a sum over a single x. And you know, using this uh, Feynman analog model ideas, uh, sorry, you can quite quickly find that the uh, Pomeranian intercept had to be near one. Now, the idea did not quite work in the dual resonance model of extreme theory, and this is because of the presence of massless particles, which eventually was one of the real killer of, uh, of the Adronic string. Um, so after Toft's paper, I realized that what I had been advocating in the dual resonance model was a large N F expansion at fixed G string squared times N F. And later, converted to QCD, it was easy to reformulate it as a one over N expansion in QCD where you keep the ratio N F over N C fixed. And this re gives a reinterpretation of those planar and cylinder topology now really in terms of QCD diagrams. And this is what is sometimes referred to as the topological expansion of QCD. And nowadays is sometimes used in connection with holography, for instance, a series of paper by Kiritsis and collaborators. And I still believe there is some truth in all of that because QCD, unlike the string, has a mass gap. And that should lead somehow through the argument I just presented to some kind of supercritical Pomeron for the LHC. Uh, and uh, it has also been used, this idea, phenomenologically in the so-called dual pattern model approach to soft high energy physics. For instance, you can see a physics report by Capella et al. Now, then real perturbative QCD, and there I will touch on these three topics, factorization theorems, jet calculus, and fracture functions. So factorization theorem and the QCD part of model. Well, as you know, the original OPE derivation of scaling violations in QCD by Frank and, and, and David uh, had been reformulated in a physically more transparent way by Altarelli Parisi and also Dokchitz, uh, Gribov, and Lipatov, the so called the GLAP group. And uh, Roberto Petronzo, who had just arrived from Rome as a CERN fellow in 1978, was uh, quite familiar, you know, through his interactions with Altarelli and Parisi about that reinterpretation. And then with Amati and Roberto, we asked ourselves whether the GLAP approach could allow for a derivation of the QCD improved part of model to be applied to processes other than deep inelastic scattering, where you don't have processes in which you don't have the OPE approach available. And uh, to this purpose, we had to show that collinear or mass singularities when present can be lumped or factorized into some universal non-perturbative quantities such as structure and fragmentation functions, while, of course, their evolution would be calculable in perturbation theory thanks to asymptotic freedom. And we made use of general theorems on infrared and mass singularities due to Kinoshita, Lee, Nauenberg. And uh, we were facing competition from an American group one representative of which is here, and had many exchanges, I remember, with Hover George, who was visiting CERN that year. And eventually, also thanks to work by Al Mueller and also others, this QCD part of model got established at least to a physicist level of rigor. Uh, so for instance, this is our paper we wrote two papers, and uh, I flash very quickly. This is a paper by Keith, George I. Makacek, Politzer, and Ross, Graham Ross. 
Then that same year, with Konishi and Ukawa, we introduced the description of QCD jet evolution in terms of a branching process and dubbed it a jet calculus. I see that it is now coming back and being extended to n to the small n leading order, where small n, I think, it is 2, but I'm not quite sure. Dixon, for instance, has written, Lance Dixon, papers on this. So this is the, a, a little picture of the <coughs> branching process, which is perturbatively calculable. And then the year after, with Daniele Amati, we proposed pre-confinement as a description of the final stage of the perturbative branching process, the final state being described in terms of a set, set of limited mass color singlet combinations of quarks and gluons. And if to that picture you add coherence, very important in, can, in taking out certain parts of phase space, and adronization models of which probably we'll hear more from Sorstand. Um, uh, and there, there were important contributions by Al Müller, Bassetto, Ciafaloni, Marchesini, Weber, eventually led to very popular event generation, generators like uh, Herbig, which are used even today. So this is a flash of the, one of the papers we wrote with Konishi Okawa, and this is the paper with Daniele Amati. So I'll leave them there in case you want to read the abstracts and things like this. And this time, we had also competitors. They were called Feynman, Field, and Fox, FFF. And uh, um, there was a naive jet picture by Feynman and Field in 77, so quite uh, after the discovery of asymptotic freedom, where they described this not so popular model, as they say. And then the year after, with Fox, they had really things in QCD, uh, where, you, where they were using asymptotic freedom. And um, in uh, 1979, I was invited to a QCD conference at Caltech. And among the speakers, there were Frank and, uh, and, uh, and Feynman. And I think may maybe Frank remembers, I remember very well that they were teasing each, teasing each other, both on asymptotic freedom and on Nobel Prizes. <laughs> and, uh, Joking, of course. Now, Richard Feynman must have been impressed by my talk about Konishi Ukawa and myself, and Namati and myself. And in his talk, he quoted mine, as well as Petronzio's talk, and was referring to the two of us as Veneziano and Petronziano. <laughs> anyway, at the end, I told him I had enjoyed his talk, and his reply was, well, that's because I treated you so well. And then he proposed to have a beer in a local pub uh, because he said, well, you have to explain me better. You know, he quoted me, but probably not quite understood what I was doing. So he kept asking me questions, and I did my best to answer. But at some point, he stopped me, and he shouted, but then you have been cheating me. This is just Altarelli Parisi. So I tried to convince him that there was more in this jet calculus and simple, you know, jet uh, pattern evolution, single pattern evolution. And, and finally, I think it looked more or less happy. I also learned things about English, you know, what the, the meaning of the word fraying, because he was talking all the time about a fraying jet. So I said, but what is this fraying? And then he pointed at my shirt and he said, you see, your shirt is fraying. <laughs> Well, anyway, we didn't have any, unfortunately, another opportunity to have another beer. And final subject on the perturbative side is the uh, fracture functions that I did with Luca Trentadue. And finally, I discovered later that this was also an idea of Feynman. You can see it in Photon Hadron Interactions, a book in 72 but it was not using QCD. Yeah? And, um, and the idea is to define, to generalize 
uh, frag, uh, sorry, fragmentation and to put together fragmentation and, uh, and, and structure functions, that's why we call the fracture, uh, in the sense that you look uh, semi-inclusively at a process in which particle A uh, uh, produces particle B with a fraction Z, for instance, of the incoming momentum, and at the same time you probe whatever else is left with a, with a hard probe, like a virtual photon. So, uh, so this will depend both on X Feynman and of this Z variable, and of course it evolves with Q square, and it's quite interesting to describe the Q square evolution of these quantities. Uh, for instance, this is a way to make more precise what is meant by the structure function of the Pomeron, you know, which is a little vague concept, or by a diffractive uh, PDF. For instance, if you take A equal B equal the proton, and you take Z near one, then you can define this to be the Pomeron uh, structure function. And an interesting point at, uh, was whether this Pomeron is gluon rich. The structure function of the Pomeron is gluon rich, because somehow it carries no flavor, and therefore you know, it should be mostly gluonic. And since the Higgs production rate, as we were reminded, is dominated by the gluon density, a diffractive trigger might enhance the signal to background ratio for his production. I wrote a paper with a young fellow, Gardens. But as it turned out, by taking this diffractive sig signal, at least with present luminosity, you lose more than you gain. You know, you lose so much in cross section that even if you reduce the background, it doesn't pay off. Also, the usual factorization proof fails uh, in the sense that there is no universality. You cannot measure this object in one process and use it in another. It seems. I don't know whether there has been further evolution of that. And for instance, I saw just last month there was a paper using this fracture function idea just, just to do phenomenology. We turn to non-perturbative QCD, 25, yes, I should be doing okay. So here the subjects are listed here, so let's go in order. Uh, in 77 with Giancarlo Rossi, and later on in a physics report, including an experimentalist, Lucien Montanet, we looked at uh, this, this idea of associating elementary hadrons with irreducible, which I think it's roughly speaking what is now more usually called single trace, gauge invariant operator. So not the product of singlets, but a, a single singlet, okay? If you want. So for mesons and glue balls, it's quite trivial in terms of Wilson lines, Wilson loops. But for baryons, one needs to introduce the notion of a string junction, okay? Um, uh, Frank showed uh, and in fact, I have the same, the same thing that he showed later, this uh, Y-shape uh, um, configuration for the, for the baryon. Recently, with Giancarlo Rossi again, we made this more precise in lattice QCD going to the strong Toft coupling limit, where you can do things more rigorously. But of course, this is far from real continuum QCD. So, I remind you, okay, so a meson will be given by some Wilson line, but okay, the news is that the, uh, the baryon, uh, okay, has need a junction related to the SU3. Of course, if you are in SUN, it will be an N-string junction. And as Frank has emphasized, the junction propagates like a fourth constituent. I will show you the importance of this in a moment, but first I want to show again, except I don't have animation here, what, uh, what Frank has shown already. And what is interesting in this paper, they showed that the junction, as you separate these static quarks, these are static quarks, 
sits precisely at the Fermat-Torricelli point, which minimizes the distance from the three quarks. And so if you have a string tension, uh, clearly the minimum energy is, is reached when the junction sits precisely at that point. Uh, so the importance of the junction can be seen by comparing these two duality diagram with baryons. You see the quarks, the flavor are exactly the same in the two diagrams, but these two diagrams have a very different interpretation because in one case, the left diagram, uh, you have in the T channel uh, QQ bar mesons, and in the S channel, you have these uh, four quark states. Okay, and in, we instead in the right diagram, in the S channel you have two mesons, and in the cross channel you have a complicated object which is made of two junctions and a, a loop of 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 color of, of tubes of color tubes. So, and then in this paper we said, well, there should exist therefore, according to this idea tetra quarks, and later we said also penta quarks and dibaryons. We called them baryonium rather than tetra quarks because the idea was that the preferred way of decaying of these four quark states was by, was by string breaking. And if you break the string, this, uh, the middle string, supposed to be rather long, uh, you find it goes into BB bar, whereas the uh, junction, anti-junction annihilation would be suppressed and that would suppress the decay of these states into two mesons. But the claim of the existence of these guys was a bit premature and for reasons that probably Marek uh, will explain in his talk, confirmation of the existence of this tetra quarks, penta quarks and so on had to wait for the heavy quark discovery and it's being done all the time nowadays in LHCb. But we don't know yet whether these are these guys or maybe they are molecules. And uh, I leave uh, Marek to discuss this point in his talk. So then I turn to the U1 problem at large N and the WV relation. So. Uh, as you know, as, as it has been recalled, Weinberg's old argument that strong interactions automatically respect CP is invalidated by instantons. In other words, you cannot have the cake, which means solving the U1 problem, and ET2, solving the strong CP problem. And from, from what we know, QCD chooses to, uh, to have the cake, okay, <laughs> to solve the U1 problem and to be stuck with CP. So uh, furthermore, it seems to be able to do so, to solve the U1 problem at leading order in a small NF over NC expansion, uh, under which conditions you can prove that there is a, a singlet, a contribution to the singlet pseudoscalar mass squared, which is given by this formula to NF over F pi squared, times the topological susceptibility in the theory with no quarks. Uh, F pi square goes like NC, chi T should be of order one in one over NC. So this is the NF over NC uh, contribution to the pseudoscalar mass matrix. And agreement with the data requires a chi T in young mills of order 180 MeV to the fourth. This was found already then. Uh, this was a first attempt to uh, measure this on the lattice with the Vecchia, Fabricius, and Giancarlo. And, uh, but this was very noisy. But there was an evidence that it was non-zero. It was very difficult to get a precise number. But by now, more recent contributions of Kaiti Young Mills that use overlap fermions, which had the advantage of obeying the Ginsburg-Wilson relation. And therefore, in, in that formulation, chi t is fully non-perturbative, whereas in, in our old formulation of the topological charge density, there is a perturbative 
contribution to be subtracted, and that, that what makes things difficult. So they get numbers like 190 to the fourth, which is uh, well within what it's needed to explain the pseudoscalar spectrum. Uh, it has also been checked by Del Debbie et al., for instance, that chi t young mills is roughly independent of NC. They went up to, say, NC equal 7, 8, I forgot exactly, and they see really NC independence. And that is in sharp contrast with dilute instanton expectations where it should fall off exponentially in NC. Um, then there is the large N story, the paper I wrote with Paolo Di Vecchia, and parallel work by the group of Rosenzweig, Schechter, and Tra Trahern, Nathan Arnovit, and Ed Witten. And uh, while I flash the transparency, the, the, the form of the effective action, uh, that summarizes basically all the properties that follow at large N, all the properties that follow from spontaneous symmetry breaking, the species breaking due to quark masses, the effect of the strong anomaly, and those of the theta angle. So, and, um, so it, it gives uh, directly the WV relation, show how different quantities depend on theta, how the theta dependent disappears if one quark is massless. This is why I still believe that there is an important special point in parameter space where theta is unobservable. And uh, it also connects topological susceptibility of pure young mills to the one in QCD. And it also shows how periodicity in theta is recovered, which is not trivial, due to some theta dependence of certain quantities, but it's thanks to some level crossing at, at theta equal pi, mod 2 pi. And it can also be extended to the, in, include an axiom field and to determine its potential. And finally, finally, there is also the electrodipole moment of the neutron story, uh, which happened at CERN when Di Vecchi and Witten were visiting the division. Uh, Rod Kruther was there at junior staff. And uh, we had a few discussions about theta dependence and decided to look for strong CP violations in hadronic physics as a result of non-vanishing theta. And we wanted to make, make sure that these effects were really unavoidable and at least in principle observable. And we first computed the contribution of theta to eta to 2 pi. I learned yesterday, or perhaps I had forgotten and I was recalled yesterday by Arcadi that they did independently exactly the same calculation of eta to 2 pi to leading order in theta. And that was theoretically quite simple, but could hardly put very strong bounds on theta. And so then we turned to the neutron electron dipole moment we were aware of a computation by Balluni, which was giving an estimate of, of this proportionality constant between dn and theta. He had a, a, fa a fudge factor, and was, there was no real proof that it could not be zero by some unknown reason. And uh, so what we succeeded to do was first to compute the CP violating pionucleon coupling using current algebra. So a coupling without the gamma phi. And, uh, and then the crucial point was to realize that if you consider now the coupling of the photon to the nucleon through a pion loop, and you use in one vertex the, the CP conserving and in the other vertex the CP violating uh, pion nucleon coupling, you produce an effect which is logarithmically enhanced. Okay, it goes to zero as m pi goes to zero. We know that there is no, no CP violation in that case, but there is an extra log pi enhancement. And since this, we argued, was the only diagram given, sorry, given that enhancement, we concluded that uh, you know, the effect was there and could not be got, gotten rid of. Ah, then the proton spin crisis, which I emphasized many times is not a real crisis, 
that, by the way, the true spin of the photon is one half, don't worry. <laughs> but it's yet another manifestation of the U1 anomaly. What's small is the matrix element of, a, well, of the topological charge in the nucleon, if you want, and uh, with respect to its uh, naive value. And with uh, Gram, Shore, and Nison, uh, we arrived at a rather amusing expression for the ratio of the singlet to the octet polarized structure function, which contains a renormalization group invariant factor, which is one in the OZI limit, and a scale-dependent term, which contains the derivative of the topological susceptibility, now in full QCD, not in Ian Mills. And, um, and this is scale dependent. And in fact, the scale dependence of this term matches exactly the scale dependence of sigma 1, which is uh, non renormalization group invariant. So you go to the scale at which the, the, the measurement is made, and you estimate. And this is uh, 1 in the OZI limit. Uh, OZI means uh, you know, unquenched things, you neglecting the anomaly, basically. And, um, and we found from QCD some rules that it was about the 0.6, and that would be uh, restore uh, the, the disagreement with the data. So we say if this is the guy which is responsible uh, for this screening of the topological charge, then this phenomenon should occur irrespectively of the target, whether it's a proton or a pion or, or something else or an electron. But I don't know whether this has been tested. Um, finally, I think this is the final subject, SUSY variance and another large N limit. So for quite a while, I also worked on SUSY extensions of young Mills and QCD, in particular using effective Lagrangians with Shimon Yankelovich and also instanton calculations. And of course, SUSI allows to get analytic results that are not available in QCD itself. And one particular calculable quantity is the Gluino condensate in super young Mills, as you probably know. And much later, however, that work, the reason I'm talking about this is that work turned out to be possibly useful for QCD itself. So this is the story of planar equivalence, what we call planar equivalence. And it's a very simple idea. Generalize QCD to n different from 3 in new ways by playing with the matter representation. And one possibility, which is called QCD orientifold for some stringy region, reasons, is to assign the quarks to the two index antisymmetric representation of SUN plus its complex conjugate. And as in the Toft expansion, NF is kept fixed. In fact, NF has to be smaller than 6, or you lose asymptotic freedom in this case, because the fermions now are in a bigger representation for large N. Uh, but fermions are dynamical, instead of, in spite of the fact that NF is fixed. And the interesting thing is that for N, sorry, in this transparency, N means always NC. For n equal 3, of course, to have two index antisymmetric or to have the fundamental representation is the same. So for n equal 3, this is ordinary QCD. Furthermore, for n equal 2, two index antisymmetric is, is a singlet, and therefore, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the quarks have no color and decouple. So we have two points on which to hang n equal infinity and n equal 2. And um, the claim of planar equivalence says that at large n, a bosonic C even sector of QCD orientifold is equivalent to a corresponding sector in QCD adjoint, where instead of the fermions in this two index antisymmetric representation, you put them in the adjoint, uh, but taking them to be Majorana fermions. 
And uh, okay, this you can give perturbative, you can check for instance the beta functions, you can anomalous dimensions, and you can also give non-perturbative arguments. And, um, and it has been proven actually to be true provided C is not spontaneously broken, which it is if you go to small compatibilization radius, but everybody believes it is preserved if you go, say, to infinite space. space in. Uh, so, um, but the important thing is that if you take an f equal one and mass equal zero, which is a special case of this uh, equivalence, then QCD orientable is planar equivalent to supersymmetric Young Mills. Because supersymmetric Young Mills is the case of one adjoint fermions with zero mass. That's all there is. Uh, so some properties of super Young Mills should show up in one flavor QCD, massless QCD, provided n equal three is large enough. And this is the one application we had several but I will concentrate just on the quark condensate, condensate in an F equal one QCD, which we did with Harmonian Schiffman. The whole thing was done with Harmonian Schiffman. Uh, so the, the Gluino condensate in some, in some uh, renormalization scheme is given by this, uh, you know, the, this expression with a precise coefficient is minus nine over two pi square, and then there is the dependence on the Toft coupling, uh, which is dictated by the two loop beta function. Then you know, you use the known scale dependence, which is slightly different in the orientable case. Of course, it's the same at, 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 at n equal infinity, but it's slightly different at n equal three. So you use that scaling. And then the whole thing, the whole prediction depends on some fudge factor, which is the extrapolation from n equal infinity to n equal three, having in mind that at n equal two, it has to vanish, the condensate, because you don't have any interaction. So the fudge factor is taken to be of this form, uh, one minus two over n, you know, two leading order in one over n, so this produces a zero at n equal two times a residual n dependence or one over n dependence. So this small k, uh, okay, can be one or can dif differ from one by say, we estimate about uh, 30%. And it works beautifully because this was, uh, uh, was checked against the, the data, the blue, rectangle is the range of condensate and, and coupling co and alpha s uh, to GeV and, uh, and the prediction of this oriented fold uh, you know, is given by this solid line where this dotted line at the range if you, if you vary by 30% this, this K factor. We also extended it to uh, an F bigger than one and, uh, and this was checked by these lattice people by comparing directly lattice data. Namely, you don't have to go and com you know, transform from lattice spacing to some adronic observable. You can just directly compare the lattice data, which is, which is much more precise. And there too, it works very well. Uh, okay, this is essentially it. I say I have more recent distractions, but time is already off, and uh, some notes about these are in the are in this in the slides. Um, no, sorry, I wanted to go ahead. So my attraction to QCD keeps coming back all the time. I hope it's not a fatal attraction. And <laughs> And with that, happy birthday, QCD, and thank you for your attention. Start on the left. Okay, go ahead. I, 
Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I just wanted to know, uh, is there lattice data about the vertex, the junction, the string junction? Is, is it known what is the mass or what is the dispersion relation? I, 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 no, I don't know. I mean, in, um, yeah, it must, be, it must have some kind of effective constituent mass, you know, like quarks. And uh, I don't know of lattice data. I, don't, I know that with, uh, with Rossi, we had, a, we had some rule of the thumb to say, you know, how much the junction would contribute to the mass. And uh, we have some success with that, but, um, but very qualitative. In other words, there are other contributions to the mass, and I'm sure that Marek will, if, if he talks about this, I'm not sure if he talks about this subject, we'll go into much more details, which, you know, which have to do with the fact whether the die quark is in a singlet or, or you know, spin singlet or triplet, and, and many other things enter the mass. But I know that one of their fits to the masses of these exotic states does use also this string junction. Now, in terms of, uh, of lattice, I, I, I'm not sure. I, can, I cannot I, answer. I think on the it. junction exists even if the quarks are non-dynamical. So it should uh, Yes, depend. is it there also the yeah, so no, not is there the even if they are dynamical? But what I showed was the non-dynamical. Yeah, right? so then it's it shouldn't right. depend on the spin of the external quarks. It's a, it's an intrinsic object. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's right. Well, no, no. What, what I'm saying is that if you if you do phenomenology and you look at the mass spectrum of these exotic states, then I think there will be a contribution from the junction. Um, let's see. I forgot. Is it okay? There were two kinds of. Baryon, okay, my memory fails me, but I remember the. So, this is one, certainly one contribution which is independent of whether the quarks are heavy or, or light or what. Yeah. <coughs> Gabriele, thank you for the beautiful talk. One technical question about uh, this nucleon spin issue. Um, there is a explicit three loop calculation of the anomalous dimension of the flavor single taxial current by Larin. Mm -hmm. And he found that it, the anomalous dimension is very small in perturbation theory. Mm -hmm. So are you saying this is a purely non perturbative effect? Um, it's to the, the anomalous, I mean, the, you mean, the, so the running of this, uh, of this object is, is very small. Theory. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, I agree fully, yes. It's true that we say, we, in the paper with Graham, we say since the, the, the quantity we want to, which is measured, is a product of renormalization group invariant quantity and a, something which depends on the scale, in principle, you see, you cannot use the naive estimate for, which gives a constant with something which is scale dependent. So, so we say perhaps it's interesting to claim that the guy which is responsible for the effect is there. But I agree with you. It seems to be fully non-perturbative. And yeah, there is a scale dependence on top. But yes. Last chance. Okay. All right, let's thank Gabrielle for a very nice talk.